Second, uh, we've just finished Pentecost. We, uh, where do you even begin? Well, let's not. You've heard it for the last eight weeks. Uh, at the beginning of the baptism of Christ, the Baptist said, I'm baptizing you with water, but what is coming after me? I'm not even worthy to untie his shoes. I'm baptizing you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. Therefore, bring forth fruit for the repentance. And at the end of the Gospels, in Acts, just before his departure, the Lord said, You were baptized with water by John, but soon you will receive the Holy Spirit. And when that happens, you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and all the earth. I think those are bookends to what the Christian life is meant to look like, very fruit and very witness. Uh, neither of those things looks like uh, cringing in the face of a society that hates us or a uh, society that thinks we're foolish. We've, there's a lot of talk in, in my Christian circles. I've, I've been a follower of Christ for something on the order of 30 odd years. And I've always heard the expression, well, we're in the world, but we're not of it. That's a, that's a fine expression. Uh, it's really cherry picking something that Jesus said, and I don't think it's a very fair, uh, fair way to summarize it. In John 17, he says to the Lord, and footnote, this is from the pastoral prayer, prayer of Christ in the Gospel of John. Uh, that prayer takes up something like a quarter of the length of St. John's Gospel. It's not an afterthought. Uh, a, a person who's minded to do so could write books on just the, the high priestly prayer of Christ. At one point he says to the Father, I have given them thy word, and the world have hated them because they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. I pray not that thou shouldst take them out of the world, but that thou shouldst keep them from evil. They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. As thou hast sent me into the world, even so have I sent them also into the world. The Lord sees our, our going forth from him very much like he sees his own coming forth from the Father as a matter of mission. 
not as a matter of uh, just something tacked on. Incidentally, we're uh, now with Christians, we're also going to go and do a mission, whatever that is, and we'll try to uh, share virtues, and that'll be fine. Uh, we're faced, though, in a weird situation in America. We have a church that's got a bit of an identity crisis. Uh, and before, before Constantine, it was very simple. The church is, a, uh, is an underground entity. The church is persecuted, often violently. Uh, the church is thought of as just a weird religion. You know these people have no god in their temple? You can go there, look at the place they worship. There's no gods. What kind of temple is that? These Christians, I've heard they have a sacrament where they eat flesh and drink blood, and they have love feasts. Come on, what can that even mean? We know something of what the world thought about Christians and what the world didn't know about Christians by the kinds of slanders they, they taught. Uh, so after Constantine, suddenly Christianity is not only legal, Christianity is the religion of our emperor, and within a generation, it's the favorite religion throughout the empire. If you want to be influential in business, if you want to uh, gain wealth and influence, uh, you're going to need to be aligned with the Christian religion, at least formally. Very soon after that, Christianity is the official religion of the Roman Empire. And for about a thousand years afterwards, you can think of the, uh, the Eastern Roman Empire as the Christian Empire, at least in its own mind, at least in the way, uh, the way it tried to run. And at its best, it functions something like that, as an icon, if a flawed icon, an icon of the, uh, the kingdom of God on earth. And then Constantinople fell, and about the same time we have the, uh, in the West, we have the Reformation, and we have every possible view of what could Christianity mean after that. Now we're in the USA, so Protestant views of what does church mean are actually relevant to us. Because most of us, along with what we hear in the church and what we grow up confessing in the creeds and in the hymns of the church, we also learn from our culture a certain language of what Christianity is, what the church means. I think we have, uh, when we figure what it means to be in the world, uh, we as Christians make three errors. The first is the default position of Christianity in the church, and that's assimilation. Uh, if we don't do anything, we will just be normal people who go to church on Sunday. Ordinary folks, it's okay. Ordinary folks who uh, we are loyal to the Jesus brand, and that will be our, the level of our religion. Uh, you can see that in folks from a number of religions. Uh, you'll be at work with somebody who is absolutely normal in every way. And then they'll say, oh, you know, I'm a Baha'i, I'm, I'm one of these, I'm one of those. Uh, some of my friends who are Reformed Jews are very proud of the fact that they, they keep an ethnic identity with, uh, with what they grew up as, but it doesn't affect their voting or their uh, anything anyway. Uh, that's our default position if we don't do anything. When was the last time you met a, uh, somebody who's an ethnic uh, Babylonian or ethnic Burgundian? They've, they've sort of been absorbed into the vast gene pool of humanity. And that will happen to the Orthodox Church if we don't become something or remain something that's distinct. Uh, by God's mercy, I don't think that's going to happen. Uh, another temptation is uh, the temptation to empire. Not to be of the world at all, but over the world. Uh, we can see that in the, uh, in the, just after the Reformation came the Radical Reformation. When people threw away all, all the sacraments, threw away all the traditions they'd received. By comparison with them, Martin Luther is still Catholic. Uh, in the Radical Reformation, uh, we had uh, people making up new definitions, and one of the things they came up with was that the universe should be based on obedience to the written word of God, the written Bible. Uh, in a town called Munster in Germany, or could be Munster, uh, in Munster, in Germany, a group of Anabaptists took over the government, had a reign of terror. Uh, they were, uh, everyone saw them, and properly so, as crazed end times lunatics. They believed the end of the world was coming, and they had to reform the universe beginning with their city, making it all function according to the Old Testament laws as they saw them. Uh, later, not very much later, uh, the Anabaptists were thrown out of Munster. That's one reason, incidentally, why Anabaptists today are pacifists, because all the ones who weren't pacifists died in the rebellion in Munster. Uh, after the Munster Rebellion, uh, a lot of the folks who we call today the Radical Reformation were seen by confessional Protestants as dangerous, crazed, end times lunatics. These people are dictators. Uh, they want to destroy the church as we, we Protestants, as we see it. We get rid of them. 
And so these people were kicked out of civilized society. Many of them wound up settling in the northeastern United States and became the founding fathers of American Protestantism and of the American Republic. Uh, there's, uh, there's a reason why Puritans in New England uh, remain uh, a very positive, uh, positive meme in most of American culture, because that's, uh, that's the foundation of a big piece of American culture, this uh, millennial belief that the world is ending, and we've got to found the world, found a uh, proper society. It works the way we know it should work. Um, I'm calling that the temptation to empire, to be not in the world, but over it. When that temptation is, uh, is frustrated, as we see today in a number of groups that uh, believe they should be in charge and aren't, we find the opposite. We find a retreat. Uh, people don't want to be in the world at all. We're going to have our own little, uh, little tantrum over here, and we'll call it the really, truly anointed society. Uh, I was part for a while of something that's called an intentional community, and it's a great idea. We'll live together. We'll live close to the church. We'll share all things in common. We won't call it a commune, because that's freaky. But uh, we'll try to live that way. We'll be always in each other's homes, and uh, we, will, we will raise our children together, and our life will be centered around the services of the church. And that sounds great. It's actually called monasticism, and it already exists in the church. Most of us are going to have careers, we're going to have property, we're going to have children, and we're going to raise them differently from each other. And over time, almost every intentional community becomes a bit strange or just drifts apart because people can't live in... Uh, in a tiny group like that without a strong leader, and then we're back to the empire. Uh, there's a, what do I call it? There's a line of thought that you'll hear a lot in uh, radical Protestantism that speaks of established religion and uh, the world at large as Babylon. I, uh, I come from part of the country in the Northwest where we have the remains of the Branhamites. Uh, they were a sect that believed every denomination is Babylon. Joining a church is Babylon. Having a cross is Babylon. They use that word a lot. Uh, so for us, it was a challenge when we wanted to invite people to a church service. They were happy to study the Bible with us, but if you wanted to actually invite them and come and see the liturgy, uh, they don't care what you believe. The fact that you're having services in a building, well, that's just submitting to the anti-Christian system of Babylon, isn't it? Uh, from that, you'll hear the language that comes out of the prophets and out of Isaiah, come out of her, touch not the unclean thing, be separate. When we look at uh, groups that are trying today to, to find an option where they can raise their kids and pass on a, uh, a tradition or a legacy of godliness, uh, they tend to fall into that mindset where the world is Babylon and we need to somehow find purity. We need to, uh, to come out from among that unclean place. And that's not really a diversion from uh, what we're here to talk about because uh, Babylon has two meanings in the scripture. You remember, uh, if you've read that uh, about 600 BC, the, uh, most of the Jews were deported from their land to the country of Babylon. The wealthy, the priests and Levites, the merchants, the influential class, everyone who wasn't needed to work the land was uh, relocated forcibly to uh, the area of the city of Babylon. And their country was not repopulated like Israel to the north was. Their country lay mostly empty, with uh, fields being worked, but cities half empty, the temple was destroyed, and nobody worked there. Uh, while they were there, the Jews were rightly uh, full of anguish. They wrote uh, Psalm 136 that, uh, that we sing every year around Lent. Uh, By the waters of Babylon we lay down and wept. We hung up our harps in the trees. And they said, sing us some of those songs you sing in the temple in Zion. How can we sing the Lord's song in a foreign land? And they kept alive nostalgia for what they lost. If my right hand forgets you, Jerusalem, if, my, if I fail to set you as my joy, may my tongue cleave to the roof of my mouth. And... Uh, so the Jews, uh, the Jews kept alive in themselves for 70 years this nostalgia. We have lost something. And at the beginning, just before the beginning of Lent, we have the services where we commemorate the, uh, the Last Judgment and the casting out from Eden. And we sing that whole hymn at, at Matins, including a shocking ending that says, just like you paid us for Babylon, we're going to pay you back with violence. And that's genuinely what the Jews were saying while they were prisoners uh, in Babylon. The saints tell us when they, read, when they write commentaries on that that uh, we can apply that as Christians. That's our response to the temptation and the passions. When thoughts come up that would, uh, that would take us captive, we respond to those thoughts by saying, may they be cut off. But the, uh, that's Babylon. From Babylon, after 70 years, the Lord brought deliverance. 
he brought his people back into the Holy Land, and then we hear the prophets like Jeremiah saying, come out of her, my people, don't touch the unclean thing. Come out of Babylon. What, what's not usually preached is Jeremiah chapter 29. I'm not gonna read the whole thing, but I will read just a few bits. Jeremiah 29 is at the beginning of the captivity. Uh, the people are going where the soldiers tell them, and false prophets have arisen saying, uh, God doesn't want you to be a captive in Babylon. God wants you to be free forever. He wants you to be rich and healthy and well. And uh, Jeremiah says, uh, he wrote a letter. And uh, I'm skipping the prologue here. Thus says the Lord, build houses and dwell in them. Plant gardens and eat their fruit. Take wives and beget sons and daughters. Take wives for your sons and give your daughters to husbands so that they may bear sons and daughters so that you may be increased there and not diminished. He's telling them, you're going to Babylon. This is the place God is putting you. Don't think in terms of, I'm here for my sins because I'm sinful Israel. Don't think in terms of, I will be delivered real soon now. Think in terms of, this is my home. What am I going to do here? Put down roots. The Lord says, seek the peace of the city where I have caused you to be carried away captive. And pray for, pray to the Lord for it, for in its peace you will have peace. Don't let your prophets deceive you, for they prophesy falsely, and I have not sent them. <clears throat> Here we are in America. Almost every person I know across the spectrum says, this is not the America that I grew up in. Uh, I find uh, the values of our government and the values of our business, I find them abhorrent. I'm hearing this from people on every side of the spectrum. Uh, they can really paraphrase each other's words, uh, just replace the names in there, and they would be saying the same thing. Um, we're in a place where the values are contrary to us, and as Orthodox, we can say that for sure. The Lord does not say, therefore, take over the city like the Anabaptists. Therefore, dissolve into the mix like the Burgundians and the Babylonians. He doesn't say, uh, form a retreat into a little community where you can practice purity. He says, here and now, in your place, in your community, build homes, take wives. Uh, bear sons and daughters that you may be increased there and not diminished. Then he says, line that uh, most of us know if we've read Jeremiah, for I know the thoughts I think toward you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you a future and a hope. If, you, if that's one of those verses you memorized from the little Bible promise box at some point, this is the context. He's saying, I'm putting you in a place that is opposed to you, that you may prosper there. Then he says at the end of the chapter, then at that time, in 70 years, you will call on me, I will listen to you, I will bring you back from captivity, and I will gather you from all the nations. When I think of Babylon, sorry, I'm loud. when I think of Babylon, that's where I want my mind to go. That Babylon is not just a place that's opposed to us, but it's the place God has put us. In uh, 1 Peter, he refers to, uh, he says at the end of uh, the first, at the end of the fifth chapter, she who is in Babylon, elect together with you, greets you. And the fathers tell us that he's referring to the church at Rome. He calls Rome Babylon because it's the chief city that rules the world. Uh, and he says, uh, she who lives in Babylon who is elect together with you greets you. It's a casual reference to the exile that the church lives in. St. Paul in Hebrews in so many different ways says, you guys are strangers, you're aliens, you're, uh, you're expatriates living in a country that's not yours. And that, that's meaningful to me as an expatriate who lives in a country that's not mine. Uh, in fact, in the Philippines, there are things that are legal that I cannot do here in the States. Uh, I can drive with an open container of alcohol. <laughs> Nobody cares. Uh, but I'm subject to the laws of my country. That's not exactly a felony, but any crime I committed the felony in the Philippines that's a felony in my country, I'm liable for when I return. Uh, if you're a Filipino, where we have no divorce, it's not in the law, you can come to America, divorce and remarry, and you're fine, but if you return to your home country, you'll be on trial for bigamy because your old marriage cannot be broken. The laws of your home country take precedence. Well, as expatriates, as uh, refugees, people in this world, in this country, the laws of our country have got to take preference. So in, in America, I can hold a grudge against you. I can dislike you. I can dislike your whole ethnicity. I can slander you, gossip about you. Uh, I can do all this stuff, and it's perfectly legal. Most countries have no laws against these things. But we've got a king who says those things aren't going to be permitted in his kingdom. And we're citizens now of that kingdom. St. Peter says in 1 Peter chapter 2, 
You are sojourners and pilgrims. We've got the whole text here. Beloved, I beg you, as sojourners and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lusts which war against the soul, having your conduct honorable among the Gentiles, so that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may by your good deeds and good works they observe glorify God in the day of visitation. When they slander you, at some point somebody's going to say, well, you know that guy, I saw him doing the following. I heard him say the following. And your other neighbors, your other co-workers are going to say, you know, that doesn't sound like him. That guy, uh, I may not like his religion, but he's got integrity. He does what he says. He walks the talk. And their accusations will fall because your neighbors will see your good works and glorify God. Here it goes on and says, Therefore submit yourselves to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake, to the king is supreme, to governors, for this is the will of God, that by doing good you may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men. Be free, yet not using liberty as a cloak for vice. As bond servants of God, honor all people, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the king. That's especially difficult when you have a king like Caesar who is out to kill you. When St. Paul wrote Romans 13, be in submission to governing authorities, he wrote that from a prison cell where the cruel, godless Roman state was about to have him beheaded. He was not writing from a place of, of privilege, saying, as long as the government's not too harsh and doesn't post taxes on your teeth, then submit to the king. Uh, so we live under a government which could be worse, but we live under a government that doesn't share our values. And St. Peter says, uh, living as he does under the Roman authority, he says, I'm the king, obey the government. In every law that's not counted to conscience, be submissive to the law. I don't like that. I would really rather be able to wear my rebel hat and say, I have no king but Jesus. But, you know, okay, so I'll crack that on the freeway and uh, with an open container, because why not? I have no king but Jesus. Uh, surprisingly, the Lord looks down on that. Why? One reason, and not the only reason, but one reason, is so that your good conduct, consistent with integrity, will put to silence the accusations of those who slander Christians. So to unpack a little bit more, what does a Christian life look like? I'm going to look at two non-Christian writers in the second century describing those scandalous Christians. Pliny was uh, a governor, I think in Bithynia. Anyway, he was a governor in a Roman province who wrote to the emperor saying, uh, I've got these Christians They're coming out of the woodwork, so here's what I've done about them. Now, incidentally, I tortured some of them to find out what they believe. And here's what I found out. But he says, they meet weekly. They worship Christ as God. Then they share a meal. They sing hymns, and they bind themselves with an oath, which is, it's a Latin way of saying they're bandits about to take an oath to do some, some scandalous thing together. They bind themselves with an oath to commit no theft or adultery, nor break their word, nor refuse to return the deposit. This superstition is spread like a contagion, not only in the cities but in the town, but in the country also. Uh, all, all Pliny knows that these guys have character. And I hate it. They're not normal. You know, normal people worship the city's gods. They support us in our civic efforts. They uh, accommodate our own piece of Caesar, piece of incense to Caesar. Uh, these Christians, we call them atheists because they won't worship any of our gods. Uh, these Christians, uh, despite all I can say against them, they have good character. Uh, Lucian writes in 150, they persuade themselves, and this guy is a satirist. He's writing to try to uh, say something sarcastic. Sarcastic. They persuade themselves that they shall be immortal and they live forever, so that they despise death. Some of them offer themselves to it voluntarily. Their lawgiver taught them that they were all brothers. They worship that crucified philosopher, and they live according to his laws, so they hold all their possessions alike as worthless and consider all their property common. These people, they're living selflessly and putting eternity before their immediate needs, they're crazy. When, when the Evangelical Orthodox group came into the Orthodox Church in 1987, I think it was, uh, a friend of a friend heard uh, Archbishop Anthony say, that sounds good, but I won't believe it when their grandchildren celebrate Pascha together with our grandchildren. Glory to God, if anybody walks in the door and confesses the creed and wants to live for Christ, let's make him catechumens and, and baptize him as soon as we can. If anybody uh, raises children in the church, I would hope those children will grow up in our values. I would hope they grow up in our faith. The question is, the children that we raise in the church, will their children grow up in the church? Are we passing on uh, a set of ideas or are we passing on a life? 
who are raising future Orthodox wives and husbands and parents. Um, so how do we do that? Now, speaking as a single guy with no kids, I have all the answers. Uh, but I, I do know a few things that are obvious starting places. Uh, and just to, to put this in order, I'm going to be talking a little bit about how we raise kids or how we raise a family that grows up the way we want. Uh, but it would be a mistake to live our life as an act of show or as an act of uh, performance for someone else. <coughs> the first place that we can build a life that has the integrity that Kleine talked about is uh, in our prayer rule, in our fasting. Uh, do our children know that uh, this is how we live, that it's not, uh, it's not a set of rules? Father and I were talking a bit about piety. Uh, piety to many of us is either a list of, of rules, we know that pious people, uh, we, don't, uh, we don't work on Sunday, uh, we don't party on Saturday night, uh, we, uh, we venerate icons, we have malevins, we, uh, we bring prosperity to liturgy, these are acts of piety. Uh, Hopefully, our kids don't grow up thinking that's what Christianity is. That's, that's what Christians do. Uh, we have a list of things that are prohibited also. That's a quite an extensive list of things that are prohibited, really. Uh, I'm hoping that that's not what our kids will grow up with. I'm hoping that our kids won't grow up saying, I'm not religious, I'm, I'm just sort of spiritual. Because to them, religion and piety are uh, negative words. Back to Latin for a second. Religion means binding something back. Uh, a person who is pious in Latin talk meant somebody who does his duty to his city, to his uh, family, to his parents, to his ancestors, to his gods. Duty was an uh, all-encompassing concept to the Romans. A pious person does his duty. We still have the expression today, filial piety, somebody who prays for his dead relatives and obeys his parents. Uh, religion, uh, well, what does St. James say? True religion Pure religion and acceptable by God the Father is this, to visit widows and orphans and indeed to keep oneself unspotted from the world. I'm hoping that uh, the religion that we're passing on to our children, that we're showing to the world, and that we're tra being transformed into, is a religion of character, a religion of integrity. Uh, in the end, piety is, is not about commands and prohibitions. It's love with its work clothes on. Uh, it's love that gets its hands dirty. Do, uh, do our kids know that, our parent, that their parents love each other and them? Do they see their parents visibly showing affection to each other, showing humility to each other? Everyone disagrees with everyone at some point. Do we do it with respect? And when we're done, do we, uh, do we, act in, do we humble ourselves before one another? Uh, I was aware of some nuns who came to a community. Uh, they, uh, they came and some of the people thought, well, you know, nuns are strange. I'm sure we trust them. In the kitchen, setting up the food, somebody thought one of the nuns had taken uh, taken the food that they brought. And they accused the nun, saying, she ate my whatever it was, my casserole, she ate my muffins. Uh, and the nun just gave her prostration and said, please forgive me. And would have thought it was strange and moved on. At the end of the meal, they found the muffins. She, she hadn't taken them. But the nun knew, if you're accused, ask, ask forgiveness. If you find yourself accusing, it's amazing what uh, simply humbling ourselves and asking how can I do right uh, will we hear things. Uh, I'm hoping that not only our children will see us do this, but our co-workers and uh, the angels who are actually watching us as we do stuff in secret. Are they watching our heart become humble? Uh, serving one another. Uh, things I read just now, have you ever seen the wedding service? I'm sure you've seen the wedding service. Do we say, women, submit to your husband and stop? We start the verse before that with, be in submission to one another. Then wives, submit to your husbands. And husbands, give up your entire life for your wives. That's the kind of relationship in which a woman might consider submitting to her husband. Uh, that's the kind of life that we could live if we're living in the world to raise kids who grow up in Babylon and don't become Babylonians and then fade away into the mix. Uh, how are we making our decisions? Uh, Lucian said, uh, they make their decisions with eternity in mind. They, they live as if, they, as if they're going to live forever. Uh, so we have our career choices, uh, where do we go on vacation? Uh, we have a living situation. Uh, how does eternity figure into that? Now, I'm a missionary, here's my chance to pretend I'm really virtuous. Uh, 
I've lived for a long time in good houses, nice apartments, uh, and every time I've wondered, is this, is this an appropriate use of the, the money God's putting in my hands? Uh, I've had a few places I've lived where I just didn't feel like, uh, I don't know that I need to spend as much on this nice a place. Uh, so I downsized at least once into a few places where I could uh, still live most comfortably, but have more to provide for the church, and more to provide for, uh, for the poor. Uh, I can see the lights are on here, so I'm guessing you guys are tithers. Thank God for that. Somebody in the church is contributing. Uh, there's food on Father's table. This is wonderful. Uh, this suggests that uh, you guys are taking care of the needs of the parish financially. Uh, above and beyond that, I'm sure you're giving to missions because I've received generous gifts. Uh, I'm sure you're taking care of the poor. How that figures into your decisions and your, the way you live your life is something that nobody can dictate to you. There's uh, there's no controlling leader who's going to tell you that you have to give this much percent to the church or to the charities. Uh, but if, uh, if you're living like somebody who's going to live forever and be accountable for, uh, for how that money works, uh, I'm sure that's in your decision process. Because we're setting down roots in Babylon. I think that was it. I read in Hebrews 12. To fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the Father in heaven. And as people who are living, living in Babylon, we're living in the place where God has sent us, in a culture that's opposed to us, what is the joy that's set before us? Uh, as members, as parents and elders and young people, as the church, we're prophetically bearing witness in this culture, in front of our, uh, our, in front of kings and judges and baristas and co-workers and children. We're bearing witness to the goodness of God. Uh, we're, uh, we've been given gifts and callings and talents that belong to our families, to our tribes, to our community, to our church, to the world. The church to come is looking to us to pass on the life that we've received. So there's a, there's a balance between bearing fruit and bearing witness. Bearing witness tends to be other-oriented, right? I want to tell you that God is good. I want to demonstrate to you that God is good. Bearing fruit is the proof of the pudding. Bearing fruit is being good as God is good. Christ didn't say, obey a bunch of stuff. He said, be perfect because I am perfect. In the Old Testament, repeatedly, be holy because I am holy. So... As far as I have any answer at all to uh, how am I going to bear fruit in this culture, how am I going to bear witness in this culture, and how are we going to, uh, how are we going to let the next generation and the one after that bear fruit even more so, it's going to be the church needs to not go to church or be a church. Nobody asks us where do you go to family. I was born into a family, and no matter what I do, I can't change it because there's only one family that I'm part of. I picked my school. I went to school. Four years I was done. Uh, I haven't picked the church. Where would I, you know, Christ offended people with his words, and the disciples said, well, we're not thinking. Who else has words of eternal life? Where would we go? So I don't go to church. But maybe we can be the church intentionally and accountably. Because at the end of 70 years, God said to the, and to the, yeah, to the Israelites, at the end of 70 years, I will come to you and call you back. And at the end of 70 years, maybe 80, maybe longer, Scripture says uh, anything more than four score and ten, four score and a bit is toil and travail anyway. We're called to account. And I would like to think that uh, we're not only surviving as Christians in a post culture, but thriving. And that the generation to come will say, my parents had integrity. I know what I know, not because they taught me to read the Bible and the doctrines, and they taught me to bring posts for the church on Sunday, but they taught me to be humble. They taught me to, uh, to be pious in, in a way that comes from the heart. And I'm hoping that that's what it's going to look like for a church to thrive in the 21st century. Thank you, Father. So let's, uh, let's get your input because there's a couple things we can do here. What else is going to happen today is I have a talk also 
some kind of reflection on this topic. And then my thought had been after that to have just a real discussion um, about among everybody that's here, because Father Silwan and I, we have our own perspective. We have the things that we see and know, but each one of you confronts and considers and lives with each one of these issues in your own life. And uh, it doesn't mean that simply because we wear black that somehow we know better um, or that we have all the experience. The church as a whole is everybody. So I really like to have a discussion following that. So we can do a couple things. We've got some wonderful snacks out. We can take a little break and have some snacks. We can ask Father Silwan some questions based on his talk right now. Or we can save it for later. What would people like to do? You want to have, to have questions for it at the end? Or do you want to have some questions there? I don't mind continuing the discussion now. Okay, let's do that. So Father, Father, Father Silwan, come on back up and, and we'll ask questions of Father Silwan. I also don't know how long my kids are going to last, so that's, that's kind of a selfish thing. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, uh, thank you for your talk. That was, uh, my name is Andre. I'm actually um, uh, from Canada visiting this parish with that uh, family. Uh, Ottawa, Canada. Okay. Um, and I guess that's sort of a intro to my question uh, because uh, talking about uh, society that uh, you, you discussed, you know, we, we live in a society that does not share our values. And uh, in Canada, we're, I think, maybe 10, 20 years ahead of the U.S. Uh, in terms of uh, the going down the road of post-Christian society, whereas, whereas in the U.S., you yeah, still have division over issues, of, mm -hmm. you know, of the uh, so-called Christian values issues in Canada and, you know, Western Europe here. We're kind of getting to the stage, or we've gotten to the stage, I would say, where uh, Christian opinions are not just minority opinions, they're unacceptable opinions, like sure. or marriage or abortion, or, for example, uh, that, that sort of thing. And, uh, uh, just uh, not to take too long, but just uh, you know, uh, uh, um, a few days ago, news coming out of our home province, Ontario, I, I was discussing this with uh, Father Daniel the other day, that uh, they changed the uh, uh, adoption laws such that uh, you know, but basically, if you indicate on the forms that you fill out uh, as a potential adopted parent that you have concerns about, for example, homosexuality or transgender issues, you're considered potentially a, a child abuser because you can that uh, you, uh, that you, if you uh, if you end up with a child who has those tendencies, you're not you're not worthy to be a, a, a you know a loving sure. parent for that child. And even the minister responsible was saying that she thought that if uh, even in the case of biologic, uh, an existing family, that if it's uh, if it's found out that uh, you know parents are trying to knock some of those tendencies out of uh, out of their children, that could be considered a form of child abuse, in which in which case they would look at sort of either taking away the children from the parents. So it's very scary stuff, and I think America is is frankly headed down that road as well eventually, uh, maybe in some states already. Uh, so I guess my question is. You know, it, it, to um, you, you know, when it comes to you know, at work, I don't feel at liberty to talk about my views on these issues. I think, but to what extent, really, do we have to? My my tendency as a coward is just to lay low and <laughs> and not say anything, and not and sort of when people talk about these issues, not uh, not let my views be known, not uh, and certainly not let uh, you know anything be said that uh, could raise attention to. Uh, the powers that be about the way I raise my children, but I guess strictly speaking, from what I understand about what we're supposed to do as Christians, we're supposed to seek out martyrdom. And, and like, so, what, like, how am I? Is it right to be a coward in these circumstances, or is it? Uh, sure. okay. <laughs> <laughs> or, or should we, or should we just, uh, as Christians, have faith in God and just <laughs> risk of doing things that could end up harming our careers, harming our families? Well, it's uh, it's uh, a temptation in a way to uh, for me as a, uh, somebody who's rather headstrong at times to just uh, speak out when I see something that's uh, something that's wrong <laughs> uh, without thinking about uh, what are, what is the outcome I'm looking for. Uh, I I did I shared some shared some marketing weasel and there were plenty of people who wanted to do something <clears throat> and I was had to ask what's the outcome you're looking for. What's the, how is this going to result in that? <clears throat> I do know that uh, in the workplace, if people know your integrity, 
and they know your uh, your weakness and your humility, they'll accept a lot more from you. Mm -hmm. My practice was always whenever I started a new job to spend at least a half a year not putting up icons in my cubicle, not talking about church in any way. Let people know me as someone who they can trust me. They say they, they know when I say something it'll happen. Uh, they can see me uh, practicing humility to one another, apologizing when I'm wrong, uh, and listening a lot more than I talk. Uh, after maybe a half year, when I believe I've given them reason to trust me, I've earned some trust, then I'll put up an icon or something and begin peppering my speech with, uh, with religious stuff. Mm -hmm. We have the virtue as Orthodox of being much more interesting than Baptists, uh, where a Baptist can only talk about the Bible and Jesus. And those are great, but because we come from such a rich culture, uh, in any conversation, I could say, you know, in my tradition, 40 days after a baby is, or 8 days after a child is born, we give him his name. 40 days after someone has died, then we have a repeat funeral for them. In fact, then we do it every year after that. Things like that. You, there's all sorts of opportunities to just mention stuff that we do as Orthodox, as, as people of particular ethnicity. Um, I got to, I got enough did that enough in my last job, uh, my manager, who was uh, a not very practicing Jew, uh, she and I managed to have a smiling and friendly conversation about abortion, uh, which was a surprise to me. I really, that's one that I don't want to talk about in work at work. I worked at liberal arts college, so I was already young man out anyway. Um, and she was able to say, you know, I don't think I could vote for anyone who would take a woman's right to choose. And with gentleness, because I knew her, I could say, uh, we feel that no one has a right to choose to kill anyone. And uh, because it was said with love to someone who knew me, I was able to say that with trust. Uh, and uh, the whole department dissolved not long after that, so I don't know what would have happened. But uh, I think that our job is to, uh, to earn trust, to become someone who has a right to have an opinion. Uh, I'm not going to go down the street publicly uh, announcing my opinions on things uh, on some issues. You know, we live in a weird historical bubble where we have representative government. When has that ever been the case? The Athenian democracy lasted just a little while, it's gone. The Roman Republic was never all that democratic and it's gone. Uh, the Isle of Man, there, there are examples throughout history of representative <coughs> government that last. But here and now, we have a chance to actually speak up publicly and maybe change the laws in our country. If we don't succeed, then we at least have a chance and we have a platform to say, not only uh, doing that stuff is wrong and y'all ought to stop, but uh, here is the heart from which these, uh, these things come. Uh, and to your, to your specific, uh, point there, I would hope that uh, if any of us has a child who uh, has some gender confusion, for instance, since that's the big hot button, that we'd be able, we would have evidence from a lifetime of having raised them that they can tell us anything. And we'll be we'll be hurt. We'll be we won't we won't accept every opinion they have. But uh, the child who grows up and says, "I like listening to Beyonce," will not be cast out of my house. Well, maybe he will. It's uh, that's something that you could take to the government if you're applying this uh, to adopt a child and say that uh, we have our traditions. You know, in my uh, my ethnic group and my tradition. Those are key words. Uh, we have our traditions and uh, our way of. Uh, managing our lives. Uh, but if you're looking for a checkbox, no, I won't reject my child because they have a different belief system or because they have some kind of gender confusion. Uh, you know, the actions that a person takes uh, are different from the reasons why they have those actions. And if you have a child who's got schizophrenia, you don't cut them off because they're, they're horrible. If you have a child who's got uh, gender confusion, there are a lot of discussions to be had, but you don't cut them off and say, well, you've just become icky to me. <coughs> and I think by sharing a little bit about the heart, if we have the opportunity, uh, we, can, we can make that checkbox of, no, I don't believe that gay sex is right. Uh, we can put that in context. Mm -hmm. Because the gospel doesn't consist of a list of sexual don'ts, even if the media today thinks that's what our gospel is. It's amazing to me how many, how many people, I'm a former member of a particular party, and uh, it was amazing to me as a delegate to our state convention how many people uh, believe that Christian morality consists of about you know, no abortion and about three sexual prohibitions, and that's what morality is. And I want them to go back and read what Lucian and Pliny wrote about Christians. That's what morality is. The 
come anywhere close. Yeah, yeah. I, I guess that from a practical point of view, I would just hope if I if I was an officer that I'd have the chance to provide that context. And yeah. But we need we need to pray for grace that we'll have have something to say. <coughs> it's not applicable in every situation, but Christ said to the apostles in that day when they bring you before kings, go meditate before him what you'll say, because the uh, Holy Spirit will give you the words. I just lost the second half of that verse. God will give you the words to say. Uh, assuming we're pursuing purity of heart and uh, we're not uh, full, of, full of noise from Facebook. Yeah, related to that, uh, in uh, some testimonies uh, before Congress, I think two, three days ago, a particular senator was grilling someone who was a Christian who had said something to the effect of, well, Muslims don't believe in Christ, and they're the same condemned before God. And uh, this congressman was just going bananas over that. You're saying that people are condemned because they don't belong to your religion? I don't think that's what we should have in public service. And, okay. Um, if my belief system makes me unacceptable as a, as a um, servant of the public, then uh, I think we have some real opportunities for dialogue. We have some real opportunities for a humble and winsome pres presentation of the heart that goes into Plus, we can use some more nuanced presentations than uh, Muslims stand condemned. How about God loves Muslims and is calling them to himself, and they're looking for people to demonstrate the character of Christ to them? Anyway, are you going to say something? Um, well, actually, I was going to ask you to repeat what you said about St. James. St. James, I think it's chapter 1, verse 27. He said, uh, true religion of the Bible. Let's see if I get this right. Pure religion and acceptable before God the Father is this, to visit widows and orphans in their need and to keep oneself unspotted from the world. That's pretty close to verbatim. And, um, I guess I was kind of curious as to the work of your mission. Um, we're around here in the U.S. I know widows, but we don't have a lot of orphans. But in your mission, do you encounter both, and how are they treated in society? There's, we have a few orphans. They tend to be taken up by families, relatives or relatives. Uh, there's one kid who was abandoned by his parents uh, when he was about 10 years old in the marketplace because he's a little mentally different. Uh, I haven't got the, uh, the mental health skills to sit nail down exactly what, but he's a little odd. Uh, and he lives with a couple of families at our, at our area near our church. And as often not, as not, a few times a week he'd come by my house just asking for money and food. Doesn't give me money, but I've always got rice in the rice cooker. And anybody who comes by, I serve a meal. Uh, so I take care of him in that way. Uh, he hurt himself once, so I took him down and we, we got him physically taken care of. Uh, now he's about 13, 14, um, and he's not really able to grasp the concept of work. Uh, I don't know at what point uh, you stop thinking of him as an orphan and start thinking of him as a layabout. Uh, I've been trying to suggest to people that a person with uh, our word is Wally Bullock. Uh, he has no, no good sense. <coughs> a person is Asian, <coughs> can gentle without good sense. <coughs> I think of them as somebody who's missing feet. Uh, we have to expect everything they can do, but we have to make allowances too. And somebody can't see, but the difficulty is in somebody. Yeah. And, but, um, it's, it's important, I think, you know, in the church, Folks can kind of quit coming to services for a while, and somebody will send an email saying, hey, hope you're all right. Uh, it's so much more important for us to put feet to those concerns and go and, uh, thank you, and visit the widows, the orphans, uh, the ones who are housebound, the ones who are having uh, a crisis. They don't feel like the church can address it. Uh, they may not feel they're getting anything useful out of sermons, but somebody comes to the door and just says, hi, I wanted to bring you something. Bring some food, and they just come say hello. And they consistently do that. Uh, I know people who are in who are in great pain. They don't really want somebody to come and be compassionate to them or show them sympathy or whatever. But we earn the right to do, to do so by demonstrating our love. I think that that is for me at least when Bishop Peter was here, he came and he at the end of his sermon he said, So go out and spread the feasts with um, we had the feast of Saint George here. Sure that day, and it was still a possible season, go out and visit those elderly people, the sick people, the widows, and yeah. bring the joy to them, those people especially who cannot come to church. 
And here in America, you know, I don't have a job right now except for taking care of my family. And so I don't encounter people on a regular basis who are not Orthodox. Unfortunately, my intention is to surround myself with more Orthodox people than not Orthodox. Yeah. But um, it's easier for me to encounter elderly people and to visit them at the nursing home or wherever and to kind of like nudge them a little bit in a missionary way by showing them kindness. I was part of a group for a while that went to a nursing home near me and we brought an old 1930s hymn doll. And there was very little in there that was doctrinally objectionable. Some of it was doctrinally stupid, you know, it's okay. Um, but we went down there and we just sang all the old 1930s, 1940s hymns. The old ladies loved it. Uh, after we'd spend 15, 20 minutes singing, shall we gather at the river or whatever, uh, then we'd just go sit down with them and have the same conversation every week because they more or less slowly begin to realize we did it before. <clears throat> but that was, uh, to me, that was an example of a place where, uh, you know, I was born in prison and came and visited them. Uh, I, I think we have, uh, we Americans anyway, we tend to think uh, in Protestant terms that mission is only effective if it's bringing people to faith in Christ. Uh, where mission really is about uh, bringing grace. What little I've received, y'all are welcome to it. Uh, if, I, uh, if I can come and uh, make somebody's life less bad, glory to God. I, I look at world systems, the economy and the country where I live, for instance, and just despair. But Christ has never called me to, uh, to fix the economy. But he brings me people one at a time with names and faces whose life sucks, or an expression. And I can, uh, I can bless them. I can do something for this person. It's hard to be around people with problems. Like, actually, yeah. say that, but I do have a one brother in law my in-laws have tried to get my husband and I to sign paperwork that we would take care of him when I pass away. And it has been a very, very difficult thing to talk about because I feel like we're being unchristian and selfish by not wanting to take on his care. But he's 21 years old now, and it sounds a lot like this young man that you have at your parish. Um, he's schizophrenic, and he has a lot of other issues, but we don't really want him around him our children on a daily basis because yeah. it's very unpredictable. But to take care of him and show him love whenever we can, if my in-laws pass away and he doesn't have somebody, if he goes to a group home, we would still continue our relationship with him. But it's very hard to be around people with difficulties like that. It, it's a cross. Yeah. Um, kind of two questions is, uh, well, many questions, but along with the question of uh, what's best for your family, what, what can you do? And by that, I mean, what, not just what should you do, what can you do? What, what is possible for you guys in your current emotional, physical, uh, financial state? Um, I don't really have no answer for that. The other question is, uh, what is what does he need uh, in the short term and in the long term? Um, I don't like making open-ended commitments to anything. Uh, maybe that's why I'm not married. Um, but in, in a case like that, where you're young, he's young, uh, and you have no idea what's coming down the road, um, maybe a, a shorter term commitment is, is valid. valid. Uh, thankfully, I'm not your spiritual father. <laughs> uh, I, I would say, though, that uh, thinking about what's best for him, and that may or may not be uh, a matter of living in your home with you. It's, uh, you look at, look at a situation where you could make a difference, uh, is the difference that I can make there, is it the best? That's, that's not meant to be a question, a rhetorical question with an obvious answer. That's just uh, throw that out there and see what God does. I'm ready to sit down and have a snack. Okay, so why don't we take five, five minutes and have a little something to drink and eat and then we'll continue on.